episode of The Future of You, I'm blessed by the algorithm to be joined by a pastor and an anthropologist to discuss digital religion. Dr. Beth Singler is the Assistant Professor in Digital Religions, yes that's religions plural, we'll get into that in a moment, at the University of Zurich. And Dr. Joshua K. Smith is a pastor and theologian researching ethics around emerging technologies, including robotics. In this discussion, we cover the trends in digital religion, how people are developing communities and ideas about technology online, as well as how AI shapes and moulds what we are doing spiritually. The conversation covers our perspective bias at the dawn of a new millennium, anthropomorphism of AI, whether AI can help us become better moral beings, corporatist agency, personal agency and AI politicians, and the ongoing outsourcing of our own decision-making to AI. The focus inevitably turns to nihilism, apocalypticism, and the re-emergence of the satanic and occult aesthetic. And we even talk aliens. So join me, Beth, and Josh for a chat about digital religion and our spiritual identity online. Well, hi, Beth and Josh. Thank you for joining me here on The Future of You. Great to have you both here with me. It's really great to be here and to be able to have this chat with you both. Yeah, it's nice to meet you both. I've been wanting to talk to you both for ages. Um, Now, I'm right out of my comfort zone on this one, um, talking about religion and theology, but I'm hoping I might be able to catch up a bit on the technical digital side. For the listeners of the podcast, I wonder if you could both just tell us a little bit about what you do, because I know you are both in very, very different ways involved with tracking digital religion and looking at theology and technology and how they interplay in that culture. I wonder if you could just share a little bit of your work and tell us a a bit about your methods in the madness. Sure. My name is Josh. I'm a pastor in Mississippi. Um, So in, in North America, I primarily do that as my full-time job, uh, but I'm also a, a researcher. And so I look into robotics and kind of the social ethics concerns um, from a theological perspective, of course, but uh, that's kind of my my area of focus. And I just kind of happened to fall into it by accident um, while doing um, my doctoral work and uh, just kind of, I don't know, I felt like it chose me. I didn't choose it. Um, so everything from war robots, sex robots, um, work industry, anything that has to do with kind of the disruptive technologies and, um, and how that fits in with our ideas about, uh, morality and, and ethics, um, as a society. So that's kind of what I do in my night job and my day job is just helping people in crisis and, um, and trying to, to be a force for good. Uh, Well, I am the new assistant professor in digital religions at the University of Zurich. Uh, I'm an academic. I've been working in the area of AI and religion and religion and technology. um, Well, since I went back to my master's in 2010, where I started looking at people's spiritual identities online. So I'm primarily an anthropologist rather than a theologian. I'm looking at describing and theorizing how people develop community and ideas on technology, quite often with a religious perspective. And then from 2016, um, after my PhD, I I joined a postdoc position, which was looking specifically at artificial intelligence. And that's been a through line of my work since then. So I look at both how religion describes and understands artificial intelligence, but also how artificial intelligence will shape and mould how we do spirituality, religiosity, uh, not down to a specific faith, but I look at all different faith groups and um, the development of new religious movements and new spiritualities on the internet and in social media and 
basically that's uh, an area of particular interest for me, AI and religion. I remember when you and I had a, a, a conversation on Twitter about an amazing job, which was like head of the apocalypse or something like that. <laughs> Some university department. And I think we both thought that just sounded fantastic. <laughs> well, yeah, there's certainly people who are looking at uh, questions of apocalypse, uh, existential risk, the concerns about what will happen with technology, in particular artificial intelligence, is probably why we were both looking at it. Mm. Well, we'll come back to that because it is we're at a fascinating time, I think, in which all of that's popping up again. What are your um, observations and insights around how this area is changing? What sorts of trends have you observed of, of late that you think are, are, t- are taking hold or already have taken, taken hold and are having quite a big impact on various areas of our life, society, culture, etc.? Well, in in terms of the technology, it's it's really hard to keep up with the exponential growth of applications. And a lot of those applications are not very apparent. They're invisible. There's not very much transparency in where they're being applied and what's happening as a result of them. Uh, in the technology itself with artificial intelligence, it's sometimes hard to understand why particular decisions and outcomes come out of uh, the algorithmic decision-making system. So in that sense, it's hard to keep up with some of the trends and the changes, but we can make some sort of uh, thematic continuities out in the discussion. We've already had mention of the apocalypse. Uh, As soon as there is the smallest, most incremental advancement in AI technology or digital technology, I immediately, as an anthropologist, see people online panicking about the end of the world and the Terminator and Skynet and all this is going to go down that very familiar science fiction route. So we're always going to see those sorts of repeating patterns. And as a religious studies scholar as well, I I look out for religious narratives and tropes that repeat, um, that we've had them historically for a long time, quite often monotheistic Western civilization tropes, but they play out again and again in our imaginaries of artificial intelligence. Yeah, I I think it goes in cycles. Um, so we're just in another cycle of, of challenge and change. Um, not really anything significant, but um, like Beth was saying, uh, any any challenge to what we've kind of known always brings fear. And that is very much, um, you know, any, any challenge to our anthropology or um, I think I've been thinking a lot about electricity lately and, and how uh, society responded to that. And it's very much similar to how we're responding to AI and advanced robotics now. Um, it's still a lot of challenge, especially from a religious perspective. You see a lot of pessimism, um, but a lot of inconsistencies in how people apply those technologies because we use them every day and incorporate them into our life. Um, and they may be very invisible as far as like how it changes us, but we're very, humans are very inconsistent and how they are both afraid of technology, but they're also kind of attached to it in a lot of different ways. And and so I don't think anything is changed or is new. It's just, we've, we're in a new century. So we, we just, that's the only thing that's changed. And I think about this too, especially as my study of theology and Beth knows this as well, is that, you know, every generation has had like some type of vision of the apocalypse and, you know, for a long time, it was the Pope, you know, this, this is the Antichrist or whatever. And um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know, like, I just try to be a, a false or a false optimist or a calm pessimist is kind of where I fall into and, and try not to um, buy into the doom and gloom, you know, so try to be hopeful. It's funny you mentioned that about, because I've got it on my notes here to ask you, is there something weird about the new millennia? You know, is there something about going into a new millennium that's, I don't know, creates some sort of, as you say, you know, fear and uncertainty, but maybe even more than that, like a moral panic, especially when there's new technology around. I don't know. Is it nothing to do with it? Is it, is it just um, just accidental or, or what? I, I think there's a there's certainly a perspective bias. So we are in this moment as individuals and as communities observing events and interpreting them as a part of our own narrative. So that leads us into 
thinking that this is the most significant time there has ever been because we are the ones because we're in it <laughs> we're in it right so we know historically and obviously okay time is also socially constructed so the millennium isn't the millennium for every cultural group but we know historically there have been numerous fears of the apocalypse i think to to pick up on joshua's point about um, technologies being disruptive. And yes, you can look historically and say, okay, the advent of electricity was a significant moment. It changed society, changed how we communicate, how we travel, all these aspects. I think what's slightly different, if not entirely new about AI, is the way that we anthropomorphize it, that it's not just a technology that changes things. It's a technology that is being created intentionally by humans to interact with humans. So that interactivity makes it significantly different, I think, to things like electricity or the spinning jenny of the Industrial Revolution or the emergence of the novel, that it talks back because we are creating it to talk back. It creates things that seemingly happen on their own. So the narratives we're telling ourselves about AI in particular is that it is a person before it, it could be anything like a person. And there's a whole big philosophical slash theological debates about that, which I'm, I describe, but I'm not necessarily uh, qualified to get into the nitty gritty of. But I think it's interesting that, yes, in this moment, we can tie it into where we are historically, we can tie it into subjective bias, but also we're interacting with a technology that interacts back with us in a way that other things didn't. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that makes some of the best science fiction, the best science fiction, that it's about communications, technologies, um, and not just, you know, sending something up into space or some sort of military uh, technology. It is that. That's what captivates people's imaginations, isn't it? And, so, and where do you two stand on um, this anthropomorphization of robots and that leading to conversations around robot rights and the way in which we will interact, as you say, Beth? Um, I mean, do you take the instrumentalist view or are you a bit more... I don't know, a, a bit more open minded about the way in which we might come to emote with these beings. Yeah, I've um, I've been on a journey with this question um, for years now, thinking about um, the nuance here when we talk about persons and we talk about something I think that is a feature of human uh, of us as a creature, um, a created being that we want to see ourselves in our creation. We want to see ourselves um, even in the animal kingdom and how, you know, we deal with domestic pets. And I would say even how, if you really look at things like cattle and stuff, and you look in their eyes, you see a lot of beauty. You see, not that we know what it's like to be a cow or any other animal. Um, you can make assumptions, but we project something to them. And, Anything that squeals or says ouch or barks or, you know, squirms, feels pain, we we give it a new level. And and I think the same thing is true of AI and, and robots. It's not necessarily that there's something underneath the hood or behind the face, so to speak, but that we will struggle, especially if you're more open, if your moral circle is a little bit wider than some such as the instrumentalists. You know, and, and I tend to, to be sympathetic towards that because in my religious background and, you know, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, especially with my study of Judaism, there is moral consideration of animals and of creation because it's not that I am a conqueror of the world, like this world is given to us to conquer in and dominate, but that I am a steward of the world. And so everything within the world is for me to help flourish, to make it grow, to make it blossom, to create beauty, to be creative with that. And, and I think AI and robots certainly can be a part of that, but there's also a darker side um, that we all know it can be very destructive, very disruptive. And so I see our part is not necessarily saying yes or no to whether or not we give more consideration to certain robots, qualified robots or AIs, but to, to make sure that, you know, it's not harming other people. Um, it's not um, socially disruptive as, and some of them are very disruptive right now and are causing harm. Right. And so I see it as a way, I see personhood as a way to kind of mitigate some of those harms 
it's not necessarily for me about, you know, making a, a robot person like me. Um, I don't think that'll ever be the case. Uh, I think we're, we will always be biologically distinct. Um, but just because I'm distinct from something doesn't mean I have a right to treat it however I want to. And so that is my concern for that question. Like, I'm not saying habeas corpus, all rights to robots. You know, um, I'm very closely related to David Gunkel's argumentation. Uh, I'm there. Uh, I mean, we dif we disagree a, a lot about philosophy and, and different things, but um, I think we're on the same boat, so to speak, in that regard. Like, there are societal benefits to granting a robot rights or considerations or whatever. Um, not on the same level as humans, but for the benefit of humans. And I think, yeah, we should consider it. And I think rights in general should be all things on the table should be considered. We shouldn't just ever say, no, we're not ever going to consider this. Um, and we could just look at the historical analogy. Um, I've been reading, you know, working a lot, my project now about um, womanist perspectives of rights. So black African-American rights, that movement. And, you know, it's very recent. And I would still say, like, even now in this, I live in the South, um, there are still people that I pastor who think there is something different about a human with one phenotype versus another. And that is very much a like folk understanding. And it's not, you know, I don't believe that there is any distinction there. Um, but for them, it's very real. Um, and so I see this, these connections, not just with human to human interaction, but with human to technology and, and how we interact with it, you know, and some of the arguments are very eerily similar. And I, I think I have a lot of problems with some of that logic. And if you look at how the history of technology and how the black body has been imagined as a technology, I think there's even more problems about the language that we use to describe it. And so I'm very concerned about some of these arguments and um that's more than you asked for but um that that's my heart as far as like the social justice side of it and what i'm concerned about as a theologian and a pastor um about how we're using this and sometimes a lot of people just dismiss it altogether so yeah i'd like to um partially agree but add an, add some sort of caveats as well so absolutely i agree with the 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 positive of recognizing historical continuities in our discussion of both non-human and human others, including sort of, as you say, indigenous cultures, that when we, quotation marks, encountered intelligence elsewhere, there were long debates, sometimes theologically informed or badly theologically informed debates about personhood. And we see analogies now to early discussions about AI and robot rights. My caveat is that with our natural tendency to anthropomorphize, we can see corporate hacking of that tendency. So yes, it's, it's, it's valuable to have conversations about rights because then, of course, you raise these issues and you expand our consideration to say what would happen if this could happen. But already the conversation is being pushed there by some corporate interests who want you to focus more on the question of individual agential AI's rights versus what is the corporation doing when it creates that algorithm that makes the decisions that has particular weights on it that has outcomes for particular groups so if you if you hand over agency too soon to ai or even as some of my work looks at super agency when people start to think of ai as already super intelligent or even godlike in some ways then it just obscures the role of humans in the machine that humans in the corporate setting have made specific decisions on how algorithms will work. And that's not individual agent agency in an AI, that is a corporate agency. And that needs to be that needs to be highlighted as well. Have you got any examples that you're thinking of specifically of those sort of corporatist versions? Well, I mean, it's sometimes there in the nebulous public discourse. So when Figures like charismatic authorities like Elon Musk start talking about the dangers of summoning the demon with AI. That narrative pushes this idea that it's already it's already somehow in that instance malevolent, that it's also somehow making decisions for us. And some of my ethnographic research has been on people's conceptions of AI, as I say, is more like a godlike entity where people on social media report feeling that they've been blessed by the algorithm 
because particular decisions, say if you're uh, in a gig economy role and as a Lyft driver or an Uber driver, you get a series of good rides and you make lots of money, the feeling that you've been blessed by the algorithm might be reported. It's not It's not a large scale thing. The actual corpus I looked at was very, very small. But if we skip quickly into the idea of AI as already having agency and then beyond that, some sort of form of super agency, then we obscure the fact that those corporations like Lyft or Uber or YouTube with recommendation systems are making decisions that benefit them from within the framework of capitalism, that algorithms are designed to either garner attention or be efficient in particular ways for the purpose of making profit. Um, so if we start thinking of AI, hey, I'm going to use, make a pun. If we're going to start thinking of AI as profits, we'll miss that AI is about making profits. Yeah, that's good. And I, you know, I think as a Westerner, um, you know, we, we can't think about technology without thinking about capitalism in a lot of ways. And so as we think about Turk work and these ghost workers and different things, I think a lot of it has to do with like, and I don't mean this, you know, facetiously, but I think a lot of people are just very ignorant of, about technology in general. Um, not that we aren't, not that we can't use it. And so we could go on YouTube and, and find um, small kids who can teach you how to code things on scratch or C or, or, you know, but as far as like actually understanding some of this stuff, I don't, I don't think that we, we have a lot of knowledge about that. And I think that's why it's so hard in, and even jumping to the question of robot rights, it's just so discombobulating for a lot of people because for like, I'm not even sure some some of my people understand how rights work. And I'm not and I'm not saying that if I wouldn't have studied it the way that I have and others like I wouldn't either. And and so it's not a judgment. It's just all these things are so complex and so esoteric to the public. Um and so sometimes it's overwhelming like how do we even educate people? Like people that don't read, people that are that their only concern is about the pragmatics of everything. Will this technology help me in my business? Or, and so when I think about this, as far as like the church, there's not much, if anything, that's you know trying to make an altruistic AI or platform that has no desire to manipulate or you know. And I think about this in terms of uh, the replica chatbot and stuff, like purposely, as Beth was talking about, manipulating the consumer to upgrade to certain features. And I think that's the biggest concern that we need to educate people about is that your technology is not working for you. <laughs> it is working against you in many ways. Um, and even the, the stuff that we're using right now, why, why does a particular platform want me to use Chrome? Why does it want me? To, because it wants to steal from me. It wants to take, um, analytics for me and um, can't use DuckDuckGo. I uh, can't hide from it because it wants my information. And then to a degree, most people in the United States, they don't really care about that. They don't just, they say, well, what do we have to hide? I'm like, you know, you like you, I mean, you have a lot to hide and you're, there's a lot of value to your information. Um, and so just to go along with what Beth is saying, there's a lot of people, at least in my context, just don't care, don't want to know, and they're they're okay with the manipulation part as long as there's a payoff and a benefit. Um, and so it's the the click agree boilerplate type stuff that I'm not going to read. I don't care about. I just want to use iTunes. Um, so who cares? And and I'm still not sure how to help people make that jump from okay. Um, I know I should probably care about this. I'm like, would you want somebody to sit and observe your children? Like just in, just outside your home, would you, would you allow that, you know, so that they can send you an email saying, Hey, Susie or whatever. Um, she likes these things. Here's a Christmas list for you. Um, I'm like, there's toys that do that. And you know, I, I don't, I don't know. Like there's just, there's so much happening. Um, in our Western mindset to kind of push that aside. Well, like you say that we are totally being taken advantage of and being manipulated either by film and these narratives that we get pushed before us, you know, Skynet, Terminator, um, every, every 
movie that comes out about AI robots, um, somebody's going to, you know, take advantage of you or you should be afraid of them. But no, really, it's the, the creators that I'm afraid of. It's the human behind the machine that I know from my anthropology, I'm like, that's who we need to, you know, tie up or, you know, round in and so that they can understand that it's, it's not okay just to make money off people. It's really interesting that because I, I used to think it was, it's just the path of least resistance for most people. They just want convenience. But when I started to do um, quite a lot of research with, I suppose, what we'd call Gen Z, um, well, they were in the early 20s at the time, and it was on a specific project about the future of media. What I realised was that they were outsourcing lots of decisions more than I even realised to, I suppose we could call it machine learning or AI. And I remember a couple of different specific examples. There was one example of a girl who was saying that she wanted an AI or or a bot to tell her what fashion most suited her. And we had this discussion about, well, isn't that the job of your best friend? Um, and it was like, well, yes, it could be. But um, the AI will absolutely know. It will know what suits me. And it, it became very obvious to me, oh, you don't trust your own instinct in terms of what suits you. And you feel like you have to outsource it to AI who really knows, knows, <laughs> Um I has analysed and knows something that you could not know from what I take as a data point, um, a gut instinct. And then there was another example of a guy who was like, well, I want the fridge to shut its door and lock itself when I've had too many calories that day. And it made me realise that they want AI to self-regulate them. And it made me wonder, do we think Maybe it's beyond just the convenience and somehow, maybe even unconsciously, we're hoping that AI will make us good. AI will make us more moral, put us on the right path. I don't know how to express it, but that's sort of one of the things I was, I think I was starting to realise. And it was particular to that younger generation. But then, of course, I hadn't compared it with older generations. But I, I don't know what your thoughts on that. Do we think we're somehow making, using AI to make us good? I think definitely there is a very strong narrative and you, I mean, you can trace it back way before we had something that we called AI, but a very strong narrative of the irrationality of humanity and the rationality of machines, that there is a way to purify all the good things about our intelligence and replicate it in a different format so that it doesn't succumb to all those problematic messinesses that humans have it won't get angry and it won't get hungry and therefore hangry and i'm a very hangry person so that i recognize that but it you know the, this idea that there is a purified version of the human that can operate in the digital realm and therefore can make these better decisions which obviously completely obscures the fact that all the data going into these systems is from humans so it comes with all of those messinesses that we want to be rid of but you you see you know um i've done a small amount of work on people who think that robot politicians, quotation marks, so AI decision-making systems, would be in some way preferable to human politicians because they wouldn't be corruptible and they wouldn't make irrational choices. And they would, you know, and that comes again, partially science fiction's come up a couple of times and I have no bone to pick with science fiction. I think the bone I have to pick is when we're not clear when we're being told a story or not. So if I go see a science fiction film and it presents, oh, my favourite, Star Trek. If I go watch an episode of Star Trek Next Generation, Lieutenant Commander Data presented as utterly rational. And you can see his precursor in Spock, but he wasn't an AI. But utterly rational, C Commander Data, that's great. That's a story. But if I then start to perceive AI as having that purified rationality and able to do these almost superhuman things in terms of intelligence, then that's, that's dangerous because it obscures, as I say, all the problems and the mistakes that we feed into these systems with our data. Um, and I, I can completely understand. I, I did some um, schools engagement work where I talked to much younger children than Gen Z, and they're already at the age of sort of seven, eight, nine. They have narratives of AI and robots and what they should be able to do for them. And it is things, as you say, like making decisions, making good choices, clearing up for me. You know, being the ultimate sort of almost Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder of telling you what you should and shouldn't do. So an AI conscience. And that's that's a concern because, again, like that story does obscure all the irrationalities in machines that for a lot of instances, it's better to think of them as artificial stupidity than artificial intelligence. 
they do make an awful lot of mistakes. They do some very impressive, successful things. But the whole, for instance, the whole bloom of AI art we're in at the moment, where people find it fantastic, a magic trick. You can put in a sentence and get a piece of art. But if you narrow in and look at the art, what, how many fingers does that person have? <laughs> There's lots of problems in the data set that's coming and not to mention the ethical issue of using artist work without permission. But yeah, once we actually start focusing in on the decisions that are being made, we have to question if they're the perfect decisions for us or the perfect friend who can give you the perfect answer about what you should wear. Yeah, because I, I felt like it was beyond just deficiency. It's almost like duty. I'll be dutiful if I, if I only download this app and use it. Um, Josh, sorry, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, I think some of this goes back to, um, uh, like the erosion, if, you know, don't read too much into that, like where we used to have self-regulation and, you know, we practice willpower. So like, I think about the frog and toad book about, uh, the episode about the cookies, you know, we, I mean, whether it's, I don't know, it's just nothing will replace that aspect of our humanness where we, we have to have discipline and, um, and that's, there's a reason why it's hard. Um, but also the fact that like you and, and Beth were saying that if you look inside something, you look inside its code, um, those that make stuff, those that actually, they understand that it's not perfect. And so I try to tell people that it will always be, and so in theological language, we, we have what's called the fall, right? Where everything was in harmony, you know, shalom, perfect peace with God. And then humans in their curiosity and creativity, they saw that as a prison, right? We want to go outside this fence. And so from that moment, which I think every human understands, right? Even from when we're little, we we want to do something opposite of what we're told. We just, for whatever reason. Um, and so I think AI robots, they're all, they're always going to be a part of that system because it's tied to the system that we're in. So I think all things in harmony, like all molecules are attached to one another. So we, we can't just say that, you know, all this stuff comes from the ground. It's connected to a fallen world. We can't say that it's somehow going to be perfect just because we polish it and put it in a nice plastic package. Now somehow it's different. No, I mean, things still lead towards death and destruction, decay. That's the natural progression of life. Um, and so I try to help people understand that just because I make a robot doesn't mean that it's perfect in any sense. In fact, most people know that when you create things, it's a lot of issues, right? And so for every one robot I have working, I probably have 10 that don't work. And sometimes you don't know why. Um, why does this optical sensor go out? What what happened? What, you know, why did this circuit blow? What, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And I think if anybody that's ever worked on a farm, they understand that. There's some days where the pressure just affects things differently. Like the electronics in in the houses and stuff they why aren't they working why did that sensor not work and and now the heaters are going on too high and all like maybe nothing's wrong you know but it's just not working right so you know i think about this from agriculture because there's a push to automate farming and different and that's i think could be great in some ways um, but most farmers are pessimistic because they understand Yes, tractors are amazing tools and, and help us be more efficient in farming. But unless you've worked on one, you don't really understand the, like, things break easily. And even now, like, farmers are struggling because John Deere won't let you work on their tractors now. And yes, so, I mean, it, the more we integrate, the more complicated it, that relationship becomes. And, and just to my last point here is that, um, with AI politicians and stuff, it will always be, in my opinion, we will always be a human machine team. And this desire to outsource regulation, temperance, discipline, it, I don't think it will work. And I'm a total pessimist about that because we will always be, and I, and I look at to, um, 
in in the Department of Defense and stuff where we get all this technology from and all this research is, you know, even there they understand it will always be human machine teamwork. And um, and so I don't envision a society where we're completely some do um, like this complete utopia of robots doing everything and humans just have all this leisure um, just because of practical experience. Sometimes the robots just aren't going to work. Sometimes the sensors aren't going to connect. Things blow. Um, I don't know. And maybe we'll get to the point where they can fix themselves and stuff. But um, I don't know. I feel like there will always be a need for us to work together. Um, and I think a part of our desire to separate from that is a part of our fallenness as well. And our, our weakness is that we were made for a relationship. We're made for connection. Uh, with humans, with creation, with animals, and we have this kind of rebellion with it and, and this tension. Like, I'm a pastor, okay? So my job is people, and I tell my people this all the time. I don't like people. Like, I'm hardcore introvert, you know, leave me alone with books. I'd be perfectly fine with an R2-D2 or, you know, a DO, whatever. Like, that to me would be great, but that's not, in my opinion, why I was made and created and the lineage of what I'm a part of. Um, and I think that is, is a fault. Um, so, you know, I fight against that and I try to help people understand that, you know, we, we're supposed to do this together and we can make wonderful tools that certainly at some part could be our friends and um, perhaps even better friends, but we shouldn't forego all of our calling and I guess our duties in a way to, to outsource that. And the more we outsource, the more I want, I worry that we're kind of subverting our, our original design maybe. Um, so when we think about good and use that word, um, what is the good? I think, you know, well, depends on what the design is. What was, what were we made to do and why are we here? What's our purpose in life? And so if that is meaningful relationship connection, then I don't think it's a good design if we make things that take us away from that. And certainly we can use technology in a good way that that does fit into that good design. So that, that would be my challenge um, for the next generation coming up and even for myself, I guess. I hope you're right because this um... – this is an interesting point about the AI politician, because I feel like during the pandemic, we came kind of quite close. It was almost as if, hey, let's try all this idea that politicians can be replaced by uh, modelling and AI and et cetera, and, and, and technological incentives, or really. Um, it's interesting that this has come up today, because I was just, I don't know if you saw that piece in the, I think it was in the Atlantic, um, that went around Twitter like wildfire this morning, it said, let's declare a pandemic amnesty. We need to forgive one another for what we did and said when we were in the dark about COVID. And I was like, hmm, interesting. Like, is this a, you know, is this about redemption, forgiveness? If so, you know, what, what's been committed here? What sort of injustice has been committed? And, and I would say that uh, without getting into the whole covid thing but i would say there was lots of coercive behavior um there were incentives being built into technologies and into narratives beth that, that people were being nudged by and, and sometimes rather unconsciously and because they wanted to be a good person and behave in a moral way and not be branded or shamed as selfish i think a lot of people were pushed into doing something they didn't want to do or were threatened to, you know, losing their job if they didn't, you know, carry out some medical instruction. The whole area of bodily autonomy was up for grabs. And and, and what we saw was technology, sort of whether it's track and trace or PCR tests, whatever, it kind of, the whole technocracy took over. And there wasn't very much space for human debate, discussion, or any humanity, actually. I felt the the whole thing was really rather dehumanising. I don't know... Those are just random thoughts because I was thinking about that Atlantic piece this morning, but I don't know if you want to speak to it. 
Yeah, I, I have seen that piece, and I've I've seen who it's come from as well, and and people are obviously picking out particular things from that person that they said during the time and saying why would you want an amnesty <laughs> based on this. Oh. <laughs> um, I think my my particular interest is uh, in in that era <laughs> that we're not out of the era of the pandemic was where modelling was, as you say, we, we had uh, modelling going on, we had modelling of the of the pandemic, but there were uh, attempts to avoid dealing with the modeling of the pandemic or to to see it as overblown so there was that human element there but my particular interest was um in the algorithms that were employed for predicting students grades during the pandemic because um i wasn't directly involved but i have a small or i had a small admissions role at my college at the university so i got to talk with a lot of people who were more directly involved in, in dealing with the admissions problems that that caused but you could see like the frustration of very capable students who were told that they weren't capable because their schools historically didn't have a history of sending students to Oxbridge or other excellent universities. And that kind of what I call al algorithmic thinking that you are bound to the history of your context, you're bound to the, even your own data set that says previously you've done this well, so you can't possibly do very well in the future that has wider repercussions um, and it, it fits in as well to the modeling of the pandemic because it, our, our knowledge of what was going to be successful at the beginning was very limited. There was a lot of discussion about uh, how transmission happened, our, our scientific understanding of the virus improved and our modeling improved as well. But some people were very wedded to that, again, algorithmic thinking of because something we thought something was like this in the past, it's going to be like this in the future as well. So we have to be very careful that we can allow for, I hate the word disruption because it is co-opted by technological discourse, but disruptive elements in our um, data sets that we don't just see everything as history repeating itself while also learning from the lessons of history. But if we if we start to think like algorithms, we're also in trouble. It's like, what's the opposite of being blessed by the algorithm? Oh, it's being cursed by the algorithm. That There are people... Also, who say that um, in, in the, the corpus I looked at, it wasn't as significant a number as the blessed by the algorithm. But same idea, you know, but that's um, that's with the interpretation of AI as being this superpower that makes decisions. You could be literally <laughs> cursed by the algorithm in the sense that it makes decisions based on its its parameters but the way in which that narrative was being used was more there is a, a almost like a powerful demonic entity that's deciding to do bad things for me so we can make that distinction between sort of overblown narratives and the more practical outcomes of people's personal mini apocalypses when um say uh an insurance algorithm decides against them or a mortgage algorithm decides against them and that's not because it has a pure agency and consciousness it's not deciding it like it dislikes this person in particular but again it's just looking at demographic groups and making very broad generalizations yeah i feel like that's a human feature as well though i mean that um you know my uh, my father-in-law is a farmer and he was denied denied a loan for this farm that they had a government initiative that they wanted to give it to a black farmer and so for three years, um, no one applied. And you know, this is in the early 90s, late 80s. And um, they basically said, we won't give it to you because you're black. And, and so it's like, you know, looking for that particular pattern, um, I think that's a very human thing. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Which is, you know, what I'm saying, we have to be careful. We, we don't fall into that kind of thinking, but also that we don't reinforce it with our algorithmic systems. Like we were talking about earlier that the, the view of AI as being ha having perfected rationality, we're only going to reinforce those kinds of unfair systems if we think that it's actually making better decisions, but it's making the same kinds of decisions that we've made historically. Yeah. You know, you're just able to Instead of using a human to, you know, force your will, you're now able to kind of hide behind the veil of uh, your code, and um, and I think that's just going to be a part of it uh, in a capitalistic economy. And and I and I think there's there's ways to mitigate that, um, but I don't I don't know how realistic they are. I I mean I hope for them to be a reality. And I look at uh, barristers like Jacob Turner. 
um, who who's written a book called Robot Rules, um, which is about AI um, and how to regulate it. But again, it's it's going to depend on government agencies um, to ensure that. It, and so um, I don't know. Like I don't know how realistic it is if we're not a human machine team, right? Ensuring that this didn't happen or uh, being accountable um, for what the system does. And it's just like um, in the gig economy with, um, it wasn't, was it Uber or um, one of them that the AI just started detecting fraud and some of it, and they started firing people. The AI did. But we had in the, in the UK, we had a very bad case with the post offices and the algorithms they were using to judge whether the um, so post offices are so, sort of like a franchise, whether the, the individuals and couples who were running the post offices deciding whether they were committing fraud or not. And lots of very innocent people got accused. There's been a whole massive court case where they've tried to get restitution for it. Yeah, same sort of idea. I have two pressing questions I really wanted to ask you. <laughs> the first one is, what about Satan? <laughs> <laughs> I know my uh, you know we often talk about you know, AI and these being these godlike tendencies and superpowers or omnipotence but there seems to me and you you can put put me right if I'm wrong and um, Beth but there seems to be an awful lot of a, a kind of occult aesthetic around at the moment and also all of this chat about conspiracies but also secret societies and what is all that about at the moment? And have I, have I just woken up to it or has it just been around forever? We need another, we need another hour or two for me to, to delve into that. But absolutely there is, uh, as I said, there's, there's continuities of religious narratives, tropes and images when people discuss technology. And I mentioned Elon Musk talking about how AI could be like summoning the devil or the demon. Um, and that's absolutely an aspect of it. And I don't, I don't approach this theologically. Perhaps Joshua would like to do that, but I look at those communities of thought around those ideas and looking at some of these very strict uh, moral utilitarian rationalist groups who start talking about AI as basically evolving into something demonic. That's, uh, I've, it's very complicated. I won't go into it now, but thought experiments like Rocco's Basilisk, which describe the ultimate superintelligence singularity AI as being capable of, of basically punishing people in hell forever. They, they draw very much on existing religious narratives, their conception of uh, as a very simplistic view of monotheism, uh, and that has space within it for hell and, and evil and Satan and all those things. So, so for some people, that's a very strong reality. Some people, if you look at the overlap between um, groups like QAnon and some conspiracy theorists and their views of transhumanism which again is a whole big subject we could get into but for some people transhumanism is is from satan this idea that <clears throat> through technology we can enhance the human being we can extend our lives we can perhaps even do away with death is seen as a satanic purpose for some people in these kind of groups that it's it's mocking god to do any of these things even to create ai that was as intelligent as a human being could be seen as mocking god in some of these interpretations so yeah absolutely there is a lot of this strongly biblically inspired apocalypticism even in some groups that are very secular they will overtly say they don't agree with religions but they'll then use some of the same structures and ways of describing ai as a super intelligence as being in in some ways demonic so it, that to me is fascinating and I have written various different things on it if people want to dig around in my work, but I don't, as I say, do that theologically. So Joshua, if you want to jump in and talk about Satan, that's up to you. Yeah, um, I always love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what we have a tendency to do as humans is anything that bad happens in our life, um, I mean, just even without AI and stuff, it's like, that was the devil or whatever. And I hear people say that, but theologically, it's nonsense because... Everything that we know, or at least in my theological world, every you know, things happen under the sovereignty of God. So even technically in our system, even Satan is under the sovereignty of God, so he can only do that which God allows him to do. So it, it just doesn't make sense to kind of use that. Satan's just kind of a catch-all for things I don't understand or don't want to wrestle with. And um, that's I just see it as as a laziness to just kind of lump everything in that category. But like Beth was saying, there is a lot of religious language and 
all of this stuff. So even in all the futurism, um, all of the crazy rich white guys, uh, I would include Elon in that. Um, this vision of, you know, overcoming, like technology is going to overcome things. Um, I find a very different narrative in the works of, um, especially female theologians and others, a very different, and even roboticists, there's a very different emphasis on, you know, caring for society versus escaping. Um, anyway, that's a, you can read more about that in my work if you're interested. But um, yeah, I, I do think there's a tendency to blame things that we don't like on Satan and kind of put him, and we've always done that, by the way. I mean, it's just, um, I think it's just a part of our, our nature just to kind of ascribe that to something we don't like or a figure that's supposed to be bad. And and I think that kind of all gets to a roundabout way that all of this stuff, all technology, all of its efforts in some way or another is a religious effort. Um, and so I think the enlightenment has failed in that regard, like, you know, the removal of that um, part of our brain or our thinking, it's you can't undo it from people, uh, no, no matter what system you're in all people have a worldview um that they you know operate in and that they're trying to find meaning and purpose in um but i'm thinking a lot of ways people are very religious to that um and they incorporate different aspects of different thoughts and worldviews into that so ideas about heaven and hell we use words you know good and bad i'm a good person not a bad person you know you just kind of dig around and say what do you mean by that and um and even with technology I think, just my personal opinion, um, it's not wrong to create things as long as it's not oppressing, hurting, enslaving another um, and that you can keep it accountable. Like Anyway, there's lots of biblical principles behind that. But I think the biggest thing that irks me about this conversation is that people, anytime people use scripture or the Bible or any worldview and they don't understand that reading is an ethical project. Right. And I think that's where uh, there's so much terrible stuff comes from is, you know, taking a, a book like the Bible, which is a very dangerous book if you can't read well, um, and then taking views about technology. Uh, that's a very dangerous combination. The Bible is dangerous just by itself. Right. Lots of women and children have been killed just just uh, in the name of God. Right. And so um, and with all this stuff, we, we have to be ethical readers. Um and we have to be very diligent about why this person is saying this. Or why why is this billionaire saying these certain things about AI? And then now he's making uh, an AI humanoid robot. Like, I mean, people are much more simple than we. This it's about money, right? It's it's, it's all about money. Um, and the Bible has something to say about that. You know, the the root of all evil is the love of money. And so it kind of kind of see how it connects there. Like, there's some wisdom. In that, and you know, if you're caring about your neighbor, if you're caring about creation, sustainability, right? We're the only creature that depends on nature and animals and plants to survive. Everything else is fine. You just it can just be, but we can't. And and yet here we are mining the earth for all these technologies that we may or may not need, and taking advantage of different cultures and and bringing in them into our imperialistic endeavors. And so it's, it's a big mess, really. It's a big mess, but it's all theological. It's all spiritual. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, we just have to stop saying it's Satan's fault. There's some abstract thing that we're kind of pointing it to. And then, you know, just kind of look in the mirror of our own desires and deceptions and say, you know, how am I contributing to this process? Very good. Interesting. It, it makes me think of, um, I've got Douglas Rushkoff's book here. If you read it, Survival of the of the Richest, because um, <laughs> it ties into a few of those threads we've been talking about. And one of the um, bits of blurb on the back says, um, Survival of the Richest is more than a primer on a soulless worldview pervading all aspects of life, defying fantasies of escape from each other, from earthliness, from earth. Rushkoff offers something at once more realistic and more imaginative, mutual regard, responsibility and flourishing. I thought that's, um, I mean, it's a funny, it's kind of a funny and tragic kind of um, uh, book when you read it, but it's, it's well worth doing. It makes those points. Um, and it kind of brings me to, um, I guess, my final question, although I'd love to speak to you for ages about this. I'll ask two questions. Take which one you want, really, because they are connected. I was wondering whether... 
AI will be more successful in a secular society in the future, like China, than one that's perhaps Judeo-Christian or has a sort of Catholicism, a tradition of Catholicism or something like that. Or the other way of maybe thinking about the question is, you know, 50 years from now, will we be less religious or more religious as a society? Well, I want to I want to tackle the secular religious distinction because I, I as a critical religious studies scholar that doesn't doesn't really hold a lot of water. We have we we've been talking a lot about narratives and the secularization narrative is another one that emerges out the enlightenment and it's really very connected to our view of the possibility of a pure human rationality that religion will decline and go away and I like to say that I'm the person who's read Dan Brown's origin five times so you don't have to um and it's the same it's the same story that uh, AI will destroy religion because it will make us more intelligent more rational and more you know adult more grown up um and so your question about you know will AI be more successful in a secular region I mean yes I I debate whether China is a secular region it's just it depends on how you framed religion and for Western culture we frame it around as you say the Judeo-Christian which again needs a lot of unpacking but the kind of the monotheistic model when actually there's a lot of actions going on including some of these transhumanist ideas and groups that we've been talking about doing religious things without Without calling it religion. Um, so I, I agree with Josh who made the point earlier that religion is a part of who we are. We just, I, I would say we call it different things at different times. And whether or not we call something a religion is an ideological act which has power in it. And you can either be positive about calling something a religion or you can be negative about calling something a religion. So to go to your second question, because I want to quickly deal very fast with both of them, I don't think it's possible to see a decline of religion except if you define it in very specific ways. And that's where all our graphs about the decline of Christianity come in, but that's because we have a very specific model of what religion is. So no, I think the future religion will be just as important in its multitudinous forms, um, and it will be a question of whether we call it religion or not. And AI will be entangled with that because religion is entangled with society and so is AI. I mean, that pretty much had the same opinion there. I mean, I don't, I, I, I do think that places like Japan, I know it's m more so atheistic. I, I still like that's, you know, you have to really, you know, delve into that. And the embeddedness of Shintoism. And I think, like, I think that will lead and has led them to more integration of, especially robotics, right? Where it becomes a part of the family systems, you know, in a, in a way, right? Um, so I think it just deals with. I just want to. I just want to quickly big up Western animism because it never gets a mention. Yes. Yeah. We always talk about Eastern animism and Western animism is forgotten, but we have strong animistic roots and they are still there. Why do we ignore them though? Why do we ignore? Because that? again, it's that na meta narrative of. Uh, I mean, this isn't my term. Meta narrative of the rationalization effect of the Enlightenment. We, quotation marks in the West, became more serious and sensible when we did away with religion. But them over there in the East, they didn't. I guess it's an othering. It's a, you know, it's it's Orientalism to say. But it's, I'm not saying Joshua's wrong. I'm saying it's to reflect back on ourselves and say we also do these things. We just haven't categorized it in that way or, or noticed it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We have robot priests in Japan and we have robot priests in Germany. I mean, it, we've done things in the, the same, similar sorts of ways because we're excited about robot priests. <laughs> no, I think it's all the same. I think, you know, even um, like there's a lot of First Nations in this area and it, it's it's everywhere. Like it's not, it's not just in the East. Um, and I think that is a shame that we only think about that. But I mean, it's... It's so fascinating to me. Um, we look at these different cultures, cultures that we are part of, uh, part of our family trees in the West. But then, like you're saying, the Enlightenment has told us we have to have this one particular perspective and faith and reason can't possibly go together. Um, but I'm like, there's faith and reason in all things that we do, you know, and I have faith when I get on an airplane that it's not going to crash. Like it's going to, you know, the pilot's not going to be drunk. And 
So faith is a part of our lives. It's just how we want to talk about it and integrate it. And and like Beth was saying, but I do think we will slowly get to where people are in the Eastern perspective. I think we'll, we'll open up to that more is where I was going. Um, it's just, Japan is just a little bit ahead of us. China is just a little bit ahead of us, but I, I see this kind of like melting pot happening in different societies as more like integration of different perspectives that I've, talk to people about, especially religious things, like they're, they're picking parts of Buddhism or they're picking parts of, of this religion and saying that it's mine. So, you know, I'm, I'm Baptist. And so we, we talk a lot about, you know, why are people leaving the church and stuff? And I was like, it's not that they're leaving the church. They're leaving this church. Yes. But they're just picking up on different parts of religion that they maybe have never heard before. And so maybe they weren't taught about animism, but they actually have a lot of those beliefs, like Beth is saying, and they actually have a lot of those practices. Um, and so, and then the cultures where it is a part of their culture, it's like now they're they're more atheistic. And so it's just kind of maybe this reversal uh, is happening where we are in the cycle now. I don't know, but um, I'm, I'm not of the perspective that religion is going anywhere, that we're becoming less religious. If anything, I think we're becoming more religious in some of the things that we believe about AI and especially about robots. Um, and so I, I think we're just, I don't know, just kind of hodgepodge picking what we want to believe now when we're no longer just fully accepting our grandparents and our parents' religion. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't. I, I think it's, it's it could be a very positive and beautiful thing for people to really delve into what they believe and and to wrestle with that and not take on the culture. I mean, not to reject their culture or anything, but to to really challenge it. And um, like I, I mean, there's lots of things that I love that are not part of my culture and not a part of uh, my heritage. But I've learned a lot from them, and I see a lot of beauty and wisdom in them. And so. I, I encourage all people, like, um, one of the things we used to do when I was a church planner quickly, just in the uh, Northeast, is there was this one road called Highway to Heaven, and it had uh, a Vedic temple, a Buddhist temple, there were uh, there were monks that you could talk to, there was a Jewish temple, there was a Sikh temple, all in this, like, side by side by side. And we would take people there, and we'd say, look, ask them questions, uh, whatever you got, you know, whatever you would want to ask me, ask them, and we'll look at their answers together, and we'll look and and respectfully dialogue with them and i think people always walked away from that like more like solidified in what they believed originally they're like this this is what i believe and and so i think there's there's a purpose to that and and it's great to dialogue with people that are not like you and and to be open to to dialogue and and i don't know if beth has encountered this but i have in these circles is that you know not a lot of people want to talk to a theologian about some of these issues. And I'm like, why wouldn't you want to talk to an anthropologist? I mean, this, this person knows a lot about history and traditions and, you know, how we assimilate these ideas together. And um, these are the people you should be talking to and not to say anything bad about computer scientists, but I'm like, what do they know about some of these things? And so they're like, well, what do you know about computer science? I'm like, I don't know. Like we, we can, I can learn, you know, we can dialogue about them, but, um, there's just this tendency to put everybody in a particular box and um, kind of like Beth was saying, other people. And um, and I think we just need to resist that as much as possible um, and give everybody a face, so to speak, and a place at the table. Um, and I think that's the future of this is very religious, very open, um, a widening circle. And um, people don't like that, though. There's, there's a lot of people that want homogeny and um sameness but uh so the beauty of all this this conversation is that it challenges perspectives it, it forces people to especially um westerners to deal with their i guess marriage to descartes and you know like really to challenge that and why why did you reject aristotle so much and there are reasons too but there are reasons that you know we're still married to him as well and so like you know how are we how are we dealing with that not so well. <laughs> well, on that theme of exploring rather than having things prescribed for you, where do people find more about your work? Because I mean, obviously this is a very, very in-depth subject. We've we've covered a lot today, but of course we can't. This is, this is the tip of the iceberg, really, but it's fascinating. So 
Where would you point people to, both of you? Well, I have a very comprehensive website with all my publications and my press bits and pieces and other podcasts. So I'm very Googleable. I'm also a social media addict. That's where I do a lot of my research. That's my excuse. But I am I am on many platforms and also debating leaving Twitter. But uh, I'm very easy to find. And hopefully in the next year, I will have two books out on religion and AI, one an edited uh, volume and one a book just for me. But there's things coming. But um, yeah, if you want to see some of my publications, some of my things on my website, it's the best place at the moment. Did I see you tweet out something today about aliens? Yes, um, I've just done a... B- well, I don't actually know how much of me they use, but I was interviewed for a BBC documentary on uh, first contact with aliens. Yeah, from the perspective an, of an anthropologist, you know, think very briefly, um, encounters with aliens is in some ways parallel to our encounters with how we perceive AI becoming as well. So there was a bit of that discussion and the societal impact of first contact. Joshua K. Smith is my website. and. Um... Not as much material as Beth by any means, um, and so um, still kind of new to the game, new to the table. But uh, I have three works coming out in the next couple of years, um, so I guess be on the lookout for those. I'm not really sure when and where they will be published, but uh, definitely excited about some of the publications coming out on AI and, and warfare, AI and Christian theology, and then... Um, AI and Christian ethics. So if that's your cup of tea, then you'll be interested. Absolutely. I think between the two of you, you pretty much covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we do aliens, right? Yes. Yeah. Want, that's a deal. I want to hear that. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time, both of you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you for listening to the Future of You podcast hosted by me, Tracy Follows. Do like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts to make sure you don't miss a single episode. And if you know someone you think will enjoy this episode, please do share it with them. Also, visit thefutureofyou.co.uk for more on the future of identity in a digital world and visit futuremade.consulting for the future of everything else. The Future of You podcast is edited by Big Tent Media and produced by Emily Crosby Media.